The ICFRC hosts community programs such as this to address topics of international interest. We want to thank our members, our volunteers, our interns, um, and sponsors for making these forms possible since the year Nancy Reagan initiated Just Say No, the anti-drug campaign in 1983. And speaking of 1983, I want to make, uh, uh, take a few moments to remind our members uh, and sponsors that we will be holding our 35th anniversary celebration on Wednesday, April 18, from 4.30 to 6.30 at the University Club. Evites for this celebration will be sent to members and sponsors next Wednesday. We hope to see you uh, at this event. Uh, we're very excited uh, about it. Again, Wednesday, April 18, from 4.30 to 6.30. Last, I want to acknowledge our university and community sponsors, the University of Iowa Internationals Program, the University of Iowa Honors Program, the U of I Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their crucial financial support. And I also want to thank today's special sponsors, Janice Weiner and Taxes Plus. Also thanks to City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4 or 118-118-2 and University of Iowa Libraries Digital Archives. And before I introduce um, Janice Reiner, uh, who will uh, introduce our speaker, I want to take a moment to congratulate two of our outstanding ICFRC interns. I think uh, one of them for sure is here, and maybe both. Rachel Maji has received a Fulbright to research medical care in India. <laughs> Rachel's in the back of the room, and Riley Lowers. Is Riley here? No, but he's been accepted to Oxford to study economics and math. Congratulations to Rachel and Riley. So at this time, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Janice Weiner. Um, I'm, I'm Janice Weiner. I'm also a member of the program committee of the ICFRC, and um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce my friend Laura Kennedy, who you see up there on the screen. I regret that it was not Iowa weather, but DC snowstorm uh, that forced cancellations of over 3,300 flights, including Laura's yesterday. So we're conducting this, uh, this program by a remote setup. Ambassador Laura Kennedy served almost four decades as a US career diplomat. She spent much of her career working in or on the former Soviet Union and served in Geneva and Vienna three times on multilateral disarmament and non-proliferation issues, conventional, nuclear, and biological, as well as a number of temporary assignments in New York, including the 2010 and 2015 NPT Review Conferences. She retired in 2013, but was soon after recalled to head US missions in Turkmenistan and then Vienna. She retired again in 2015. Kennedy's assignments included Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Southern Europe, Central Asia and the Caucasus, Ambassador to Turkmenistan, Ambassador to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva, U.S. Special Representative for Biological and Toxin Weapon, Weapons Convention Issues, Deputy Commandant of the National War College, Sharjah d'Affaires in Armenia, and Deputy Political Section Chief in Moscow and Ankara. In fact, Ankara, Turkey is where Laura and I first met. Uh, she is an elected member of the, the American Academy of Diplomacy and serves on several national boards. She has lectured at various U.S. institutions, including the U.S. Army General Command and Staff College and the Army War College. A graduate of America's first women's college, Vassar, Kennedy also did graduate work at Stanford and American universities. Today, Ambassador Kennedy will draw on her experiences and connections to the State Department to discuss its current status under the Trump administration, or as we've been calling it, the state of state. Please join me in welcoming Laura Kennedy. Um, well, let me just, uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, let me th uh, uh, add my thanks um, uh, to our hosts. Um, uh, Sue, thank you for welcoming me. Uh, and I also wanted to give a shout out. I heard the reference to the Stanley Foundation, which I know is in Muscatine, not too far away. 
and I have been to conferences that they've hosted, so they do a lot of great work. Um, and uh, um, I'd like to say, say fantastic things about the uh, University of Iowa, although uh, I was present at the Pinstripe Bowl in sub-freezing weather in New York City this year when um, the Hawkeyes uh, beat my husband's team, Boston College. But congratulations on a great um, uh, win there. And also I was gonna say, as a diplomat over the years, uh, one of the things we promote is American culture, American writers, uh, which of course very much includes so many of the, the writers who have either graduated from or taught at your own Iowa uh, Writers um, Workshop um, uh, there in Iowa City. Now, I'm so sorry that I couldn't um, uh, make it in person because it's always so interesting to meet people outside of Washington, find out what your concerns, your views are. For the Foreign Service, um, we typically spend two thirds of our career deployed overseas. And then for that other third, when we're in the US, of course, that means we're in Washington. Uh, so in terms of getting out to meet uh, all the people that we represent uh, overseas, we have very little opportunity typically to do it. We don't have even the resources, frankly, to send our diplomats out to do public speaking. Uh, because indeed resources are, are scarcer than ever. So again, thank you so much for inviting me um, as a retired diplomat uh, to uh, speak with you. And I hope that despite this unwieldy uh, um, setup, that we can still have some good back and forth after I finish uh, my uh, remarks. Um, now, I've never been to Iowa City before, uh, when I was a youngster, I visited Iowa um, with a friend who was visiting relatives on a farm. And the one thing I remember was just eating corn right out of the garden. Um, but that, that actually ag early agricultural introduction to Iowa tied in actually to my career later on. Uh, my first overseas assignment was in Moscow uh, in very much during the Cold War years. Now, I was detailed to work with one of our U.S.-Soviet um, official exchange agreements that dated back to 1956, the very first one where uh, Nixon had his famous kitchen debate with Nikita Khrushchev. And uh, those of you in Iowa may remember it was an Iowa farmer, Mr. Garst, at his um, family farm, I think in Coombe Rapids. I'm not sure how far that is from Iowa City, actually invited Nikita Khrushchev to his farm and show off what American agriculture and specifically Iowa agriculture can do, which certainly um, got the attention of Nikita Khrushchev. So in that early example in my career of the value of public diplomacy, I was assigned to one of these uh, 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 exchange exhibits the theme of my exhibit was Agriculture USA. Um, and so one of the uh, things that was my exhibits that I, I showed off to uh, Soviet citizens all over the country, that country was um, a round hay baler, which I noted um, was developed actually at Iowa State, not too far away from you. Um, and indeed, when I think um, uh, of all the things that Foreign Service officers do on your behalf, what we do at the top of our list is to promote American goods and services. So um, that brings me back to corn, which as you all I'm sure know far better than I, is your top, um, uh, Iowa's top uh, foreign export. Um, uh, and then tractors. So for example, I was able to visit the John Deere tractor factory. I know that's across the border at East Moline, 
but uh, I assume that people from Iowa, um, you know, have always worked there. And uh, I sold a lot of John Deere tractors later, for example, when I was uh, an ambassador. Um, and uh, I can't tell that I actually sold any hogs, but I know that that's um, uh, your number third export. So again, I mention all that because I know Washington seems very far away and it's difficult for diplomats to, I think, convey to Americans what we actually do in our work. But let me tell you, promoting your exports is at the top of our list. And I can say that from my own uh, direct experience. Uh, now, let me turn briefly to policy for a minute. And that's one thing that I must say concerns me a bit, because although uh, promoting U.S. jobs and services are at the top of our list, it's a complicated business to um, uh, uh, pursue trade policy. Um, but one thing that does in particular uh, concern me is, uh, for example, the tariff issue. Tariffs, uh, you know, need to be used, but we try to negotiate out agreements that won't disadvantage American exporters. Oftentimes this is best done um, behind closed doors and using international instruments like the World Trade Organization. But I'm a little concerned when the president personally is imposing tariffs because then I, I fear that um, it is going to invite that retaliation that can badly affect all of us here at home. Uh, so for example, we're expecting new tariffs to be imposed on China uh, which is already signaling that they are going to retaliate. And uh, I know that China is Iowa's fourth largest um, export market. Um, and uh, so Iowa corn and hogs, I fear, uh, could be um, hurt if we don't find a way uh, to uh, work on trade issues in a, uh, a very, I think, careful manner and not set off a round of retaliation back and forth. Um, okay, uh, that brings me back um, uh, again to more broadly to uh, the State Department and its ability at this stage to promote uh, the agenda we have of promoting American goods and services uh, keeping Americans safe overseas, whether that involves negotiating treaties, uh, whether that involves conflict resolution, whether that involves uh, taking care of Americans who may have been involved in an accident, who may end up in jail, uh, whatever. This is part of the range of citizen uh, services we do uh, for American citizens. But um uh we uh are represented we have a broader representation than any other country in the world we're present in virtually every country except for uh the real pariahs like uh, north korea iran i think we're no longer present in yemen because it is just a complete disaster zone uh, we run about 270 embassies and consulates around um, uh, the world so that we can be there for American citizens, um, uh, whether they're in trouble or they're just overseas to study, to sell goods, uh, to take a trip or whatever. But let me tell you, um, we're in trouble. Um, uh, I know that everybody, you know, what agency doesn't say we need more resources? But for two years, um, the administration has proposed cuts of 30 percent, uh, which is devastating to um, morale. Uh, and it is being felt in many ways. Um, so, for example, um, when this administration came in, it started um, pushing out a number of career uh, uh, public servants. Um, now, every administration, of course, has the right to bring in their own policy team at the top. 
completely understood that's the way it should be. But what was unusual from the very beginning was the way that the career people who serve both Democrats and Republicans were being uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, pushed out of their jobs before new people were even identified, uh, let nominated, let alone confirmed. So we now have a situation where we have, um, after all more than a year, we have absences throughout the State Department in Washington. We have absences of ambassadors all over the globe in key places, including um, our ally South Korea, when we have um, very severe uh, uh, security concerns with North Korea. Uh, I mean, I could go on uh, for a long time, but there are, as I say, ambassadors missing around the world. Uh, and then at home, we have gaps all up and down the um, uh, ranks, now including our Secretary of State, who, of course, was fired. Now, um, I respect um, Secretary Tillerson. I think he's a, an honorable man. Uh, I think uh, many of his foreign policy views were sensible ones, but unfortunately, he proved to be a pretty disastrous uh, manager. Although it's always hard to sort out um, what is, were his practices and what were those from um, the White House. But the fact remains that uh, the administration for two years running now has proposed cuts of 30%. Um, the promotion rates have been slashed in half at senior ranks. Now, we are not like the rest of the civil service. We are like the military. The foreign service is an up or an out um, business. So if you are not regularly pr uh, promoted, and then depending on very small numbers, you retire. Uh, so when they cut the promotion rates, that means that uh, many more are then um, uh, pushed out the door. Uh, so we're losing at an unprecedented rate our senior officers uh, who have been risen to that rank on the basis of great experience that they have gained over the years. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are subject to a freeze, which was lifted on other parts of the government. So we aren't taking in uh, new employees, except for a tiny number that is, you know, personally let in uh, uh, on, ex on an exception basis by uh, the former Secretary of State. So we are being completely squeezed. And um, when this is lifted, um, as I hope it will be, it's very difficult to make up for uh, the, um, uh, the gaps that we are accruing at a very uh, fast rate. Um, and as I say, I've been in this business almost 40 years. We've had freezes before, we've had slowdowns, but um, I've never seen anything as drastic as what we're facing now. Um, so um, uh, I'm retired, uh, as I say, uh, but uh, I keep an active uh, uh, eye on foreign affairs. Uh, through um, a number of organizations that I think uh, uh, Janice uh, mentioned. Uh, but I'm also concerned, first and foremost, as an American citizen. Uh, America is, uh, I, I, is a leading country in the world. We helped create the post-World uh, uh, War II uh, world, largely in ways that, that did meet our interests. Uh, but now I see that um, we're falling behind. Even our closest allies say, where is America? Uh, we are seeing great confusion in the ranks uh, with no co coherent messages coming out of Washington. So um, uh, that's what I wanted to have a conversation with you about. And uh, uh, I'd be very interested in what your concerns are. Um, uh, I've tried to, as I say, get a sense of, of what uh, some of Iowa's um, economic interests may be. Now, of course, your former governor is ambassador in China. 
Uh, and uh, when I was talking about some of those uh, statistics that you, I'm sure, know far better than I about Iowa's exports, um, not a bad place for uh, an Iowa to be, given the fact, for example, uh, China, as I mentioned earlier, is the fourth largest destination for Iowan uh, exports. Uh, but there's many, many other issues out there that um, involve Iowa. Now, there's actually a website I would commend to you uh, call at the Department of State website, which is state.gov, and it's called State by State. And it's got some interesting statistics about what the State Department uh, does specifically on behalf of people from Iowa. For example, um, uh, the number of adoptions that the Department of State was able to facilitate abroad for Iowans, the number of um, foreign students that come to study at your institutions, including the University of Iowa, um, because these uh, students, of course, are paying full tuition. So that actually is a benefit. I, I, I don't know specifically, of course, about the finances of the University of Iowa, but I do know uh, from right here in the metropolitan area, many of our universities and colleges depend on the full tuitions that foreign students pay. Um, uh, so it helps the university uh, educate all of our own students because we get these full full tuitions. And of course, uh, foreign students bring all sorts of other uh, uh, benefits in terms of uh, their own perspectives uh, and so on. And I mention this because the number of foreign students is falling in the United States. Um, and this also is um, uh, going to have, I fear, a negative effect on, on economy because there are, um, and I've got somewhere in my stack of notes here, some figures on uh, estimated uh, uh, economic uh, uh, benefits that they bring to the US economy. So those numbers are falling. Uh, now, they're falling because the State Department can't uh, be out there uh, as effectively as they could before, uh, talking about the, the, the great uh, capacity of American education. Uh, they're falling because there is a perception, I think, abroad uh, that America does not welcome or is not as welcoming as it was previously considered. Uh, people from outside. Now, some students are concerned about violence, and we've all seen the terrible um, number of reports about uh, violence. Another indicator that worries me is the fact that um, the U.S. as a, des a tourism destination has fallen um, one uh, down the rankings. That is also a big money earner for the United States economy. So I'm concerned again about the ability of the U.S. to sell the U.S. as a tourism destination. Um, I also worry about um, uh, our image in the world as the foremost exemplar of values. Now, we don't, can't obviously expect everyone to share our values, but our moral suasion, I think, is one of the great uh, uh, advantages that America has had since its, founded, its founding. We all know and are proud of uh, our image in the world since, we, since the days of the revolution. And I think that people see that now as, as tarnished when uh, the president does not speak out um, as forcefully as we expect our presidents to do. Now, I say that as one who served as an ambassador twice, once for a Democrat and once for a Republican. I served as a deputy assistant secretary for a uh, Republican secretary of state. So I have had a typical um, public service career of which uh, I'm very proud, and that is of being a nonpartisan a civil servant. Uh, but now we find that these civil servants 
are treated not as nonpartisan public servants, but as, uh, uh, you know, if you worked in the last administration, you're considered an Obama person and they don't want you. And as I say, that is completely antithetical to our notion of public service, which should be uh, and must be uh, nonpartisan. Um, so uh, I hear this when uh, um, I'm abroad or when I talk to foreigners, uh, whether they're diplomats or private citizens in Washington, a certain confusion and concern that uh, the president appears to be uh, so, so, so relatively friendly to the bad guys out there, like Putin. Um, he's had very positive things to say about um, uh, Duterte, who has, you know, I'm in the Philippines, who I'm afraid has, has been um, uh, not the greatest exemplar, let me put it that way, of democratic values, of uh, President um, Erdogan, for example, in Turkey, who has carried out wide ranging purges um, in his country. So, um, and our allies, uh, I hear this often, are concerned that the United States that has been the rock uh, of the free world uh, since the uh, Second World War is either retreating or is spending as much time attacking uh, the allies, as we do the um, some of the real troublemakers out there, of which I include Russia. So anyhow, it's a tough world, but uh, I hope that um, you will uh, listen um, carefully to my pitch that the U.S. State Department is there to work on your behalf whether at home or abroad, and that you will, uh, I hope, support uh, efforts to ensure that uh, we get the funding we need to protect American security, uh, American uh, uh, jobs, and American values around the world. Um, now, one of the things I always like to do um, when I'm, I'm doing public speaking is ask audiences um, for their guess as to what percentage of the federal budget goes to the foreign affairs budget. So um, anybody want to take a stab at that, just on a percentage and, and um, what you think the foreign affairs budget um, accounts for out of the, pardon me? One percent or less. Oh, okay. That's, uh, that is fantastic. Who 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 got that? A former FCC commissioner. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, good for you. I tell you because um, uh, when I go around and 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 whether it's it's in the Washington area or around the country, I've ev never actually gotten somebody who was less than five percent. I've gotten answers that raised up to ranged up to 25% uh, and down to 5%. But I never got uh, uh, outside of Washington. I never got anybody to actually guess the correct amount. So uh, kudos to you. Um, and that actually concerns me, as I say, that that I would so rarely get anything close to the real account because I think people um, assume that. We're sort of giving away money by the bushel full. Uh, and as I say, it's it's 1% or less. Um, and we have an administration that's trying to cut that, that further. So um, uh, I'm delighted that uh, we can have a, a chance to talk about this. And I hope that you will um, uh, agree that America benefits from an engaged um, foreign policy, that it needs to be there so it can protect American interests around the globe, whether that's, as I say, an American uh, citizen 
uh, who may run into trouble overseas or simply lose a passport, uh, whether it may be an American couple who wants to adopt a baby, whether it's a student or a teacher who wants to go out and research abroad as a Fulbrighter. And let me just say, congratulations, Rachel. That is fantastic news. That's a fantastic opportunity. And of course, the State Department is the um, uh, agency that administers the uh, Fulbright um, uh, thing. So again, congratulations. Um, anyhow, so let me uh, let me just stop there. I think I've probably uh, gone on um, uh, way too long. Um, I hope you've all gotten coffee and I haven't, the caffeine has kept anybody from, I um, uh, uh, hope I haven't put anybody to sleep uh, in short. So anyhow, I would be um, thrilled to have um, uh, a conversation at this point. I am just so sorry that I couldn't be there in person um, uh, with you. But uh, Janice uh, uh, says she's going to invite me back uh, uh, later. Um, so thank you for, for listening. And I look forward to your questions and comments. So I'm going to I'm going to take the liberty of of asking a question of my own before we move to the the multiple questions that we have here, which is, what about putative Secretary Pompeo? What effect do you expect him to have at, at state in the administration and in the world? Thirty seconds. Oh, <laughs> okay, Jana. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, uh, question. Um, uh, well, uh, as we all know, that's not up to 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 to, to us. It's up to the um, uh, the Senate. Um, now, I actually did meet um, uh, 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 the nominee uh, as when he was a uh, uh, representative um, from Kansas. Uh, as I think they mentioned earlier, um, I was actually, I retired in 2013 after I had served in Geneva on arms control. And then they asked me to come back um, to help out uh, because it really is difficult to get people confirmed. Uh, so I came back and um, spent almost a year at um, our mission in Vienna where I had previously served as, as the deputy in the charge. And this is the mission that um, handles the International Atomic Energy Agency. So we're very heavily involved in nuclear issues. So he had come out with Senator Cotton uh, when we were finishing up uh, negotiating the Iran nuclear deal. So I did have the opportunity to meet him uh, at that uh, uh, point. This is in um, 2015. Um, he was very frank about his um, opposition to the uh, nuclear deal. Uh, and that's something that, um, uh, and it's certainly been controversial, uh, but that I, I um, very much believe is in the interest of the United States for a variety of reasons. Uh, so one, I am concerned that um, um, this could lead to the U.S. pulling out of that deal, which I think would be very injurious to our interests. Uh, now, every single, and this is not, and, and certainly uh, Secretary of State Tillerson um, was um, a supporter of staying in that, that regime. That's one of the reasons, apparently, he was fired uh, by um, uh, President Trump. And uh, whereas um, uh, the, both as a congressman and then as the director, uh, Pom Mr. Pompeo was uh, much more negative. Um, that said, um, there's a lot that could happen between now and May, which is when the president will be next um, asked to certify the agreement. Now, I actually don't know a, any senior military figures, for example, that would not agree <coughs> with uh, virtually every um, uh, sort of technical expert, diplomat, and uh, non-proliferation advocate that, one, Iran is abiding by the uh, agreement, uh, that it is very much in our interest, and that, in short, we should keep to the agreement. Um, so 
um, I expect this issue will be very much part of the confirmation hearings for Mr. Pompeo. Um, but the president, it's, it's going to be very interesting. I'm not sure um, that um, the president might not uh, face some real difficulty in getting Mr. Pompeo uh, confirmed. Um, Senator Paul has come out against him. Uh, I think um, Senator McCain uh, may have some real issues because of um, Mr. Pompeo's past record on uh, appearing to approve torture. So I do have some concerns with his policy views, most definitely on Iran. Um, that said, uh, I think in terms of management, he may be a better uh, uh, a steward of the institution of the State Department. And I think you have to look at a Secretary of State in both those roles, uh, both in terms of a manager uh, who's responsible for the very complex, um, far-ranging uh, establishment uh, that operates around the world to take care of American interests. So both as a manager of the institution and in terms of policy. Uh, so I think um, Pompeo, I think um, I'm, a, I'm concerned about some of his views, which I think are, are, are very much on the um, uh, uh, mil uh, prizing military action um, over diplomatic uh, action. But he may be a better manager of the State Department than um, Secretary Tillerson unhappily proved to be. So um, we'll see, but I think we're going to have some some very uh, vigorous confirmation hearings, um, and um, so I'm going to I'm going to reserve judgment. Um, I, I think we have these confirmation hearings for a reason, and that is to have a good, open discussion of your views and of your intentions. So I'm looking forward to those those uh, those hearings. And um, although, as I say, I do have some some concerns, some very real concerns about his policy views. Um, anyhow, so thank you for for that, uh, Janice. The first is, why is Trump decimating the State Department? The second is, who and what benefits from a declining State Department? Um, and then a third sort of looks at what's going on in Moscow and says it's it's been alleged that what's happened to the State Department is actually the execution of Putin's wish, um, the switch to Tillerson, a diminishment of America's role, promoting democracy and human rights. Okay, thank you. Um, three very, very um, pertinent questions. I, I, I don't know why um, uh, President Trump has such a, an aversion to the State Department. I can throw out some some notions. Um, and again, I've been um, retired since 2015, but I, I do stay very much engaged on the uh, foreign affairs front. Um, well, uh, one, you 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 may remember that one particular uh, uh, statement he made at one point where he said, um, I'm the only one that matters. Now, it's true, the president is the president. He does make the final decisions. But you have a State Department, just like you have the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, um, the Secretary of Commerce and Agriculture, because we're a big, powerful, complex country with, with a multiplicity of interests, we need all those experts to try and articulate our interests and sort out what is the best course for America. Um, so I think that that Trump, our president, uh, honestly thinks that he, as he literally has said, he's the only one that matters. So I think the State Department and its professionals are seen as people um, who may be giving him contrary advice um, or disagrees with his course. But I think as good Americans, um, you should want your public servants to give their views, whether they are contrary or not. Now, the one thing I should emphasize 
that your State Department diplomats do, and that is they swear an oath to the Constitution. They don't swear it to any particular president. Um, however, you are expected always publicly to support the policy of the administration. Absolutely. But privately, I believe it's your duty to give your best views on what you think is the best course. And of course, the president decides. But I think um, he resents um, the State Department as being someone that does indeed give contrary advice on certain occasions. Um, and he did fire the Secretary of State, apparently, because of his, uh, in part, because of his um, uh, disagreement over the Iran deal. I think also um, uh, President Trump was offended because at the outset of his administration, there were a number of um, uh, Foreign Service employees who signed a dissent memo on uh, what was considered to be a Muslim ban. Now, this is what it is. It's a dissent memo. It's to be um, to register your disagreement with uh, uh, proposals privately. It's protected by law. But as is so common in Washington, this leaked. And so I think from the outset of his tenure, he saw the State Department as a hotbed of people who didn't agree with him. Now, the fact of the matter is that original Muslim ban, which was not coordinated with anyone in the government, was immediately um, uh, um, uh, ruled completely unconstitutional and thrown out, and they had to go back and look at it. But I think that's part of what, um, uh, in particular, um, raised the... Um, uh, disdain of uh, uh, President Trump for um, the State Department. Um, but I think, uh, as, as I've been hoping to, to try and illustrate, it's in all of our interests to have a strong uh, group of public servants who will serve this administration, who will serve a Democrat administration, and so on. Um, we're there to serve the American taxpayer. So I don't think it's in our interest to have the State Department uh, decimated. Um, and the one good bit of news is that Congress, um, uh, by and large, agrees with this point of view. So last year's budget cuts, which were 33 percent of an already, I think, under-resourced State Department, were rejected by Congress because we all know it's Congress that writes the check. So they pretty much, and this was both Republicans and Democrats disagreed with the president. So the final budget uh, tried to restore most of those. And although we haven't seen the final budget for next year, it looks like Congress, again, both Republicans and Democrats are pushing back against these cuts because they do not agree with the president uh, that we should dismember the State Department. Now, um, I'm not going to try and sort out the whole issue of the meddling and so on, but as somebody who spent a huge part of my career either working in Moscow or dealing with first the Soviet Union and then with Russia on arms control and nonproliferation and a host of other issues, it frankly is... Um, baffling that the president has not been more willing to criticize uh, Russian behavior in many ways. And um, it is actually um, uh, the Congress, oops, I think I've lost the, um, the visual here. Um, uh, but it is Congress, it is, it is American citizens and many others who are pushing the president, I think, to be more forthright um, on Russian misbehavior, um, which I think um, is indeed uh, a problem uh, for us and what we represent uh, around the world. Um, so I can only hope uh, that he will um, modify some of that behavior and, for example, not congratulate 
uh, President Putin after what was clearly not a democratic election when you don't allow your major um, uh, opponent to even take part in the election where there was ballot box um, stuffing caught you know, on camera. Um, I don't see why you congratulate um, Mr. Putin um, when moreover it was specifically not recommended by his staff. Um, and when he also was in this most recent conversation unwilling to raise this extremely uh, concerning event whereby uh, the Russians used chemical agents to attempt to assassinate uh, people on British soil. This has been condemned by all of our allies. It's an attack carried out in the territory of one of our allies. Uh, so uh, this is some of the behavior that I see bewildering and concerning countries all around um, the world. Uh, so I do hope that um, uh, thanks to many citizens who speak out on this score, as well as Congress, that he will modify um, what I think are very unwise patterns of behavior with um, uh, Mr. Putin. Okay. Um, the, the next question, we'll bring it a little closer to home here to the university. Um, first, a very a short, up oh, it's back, it's a very short personal question. Is that Lenin on the wall behind you? And is that a memento from your, from your Soviet stay? But then, oh, what the, oh, that, oh that, that's actually a portrait of my husband. Uh, yeah. oh, that is, I wish you were here to hear that. Now, actually, um, the, the artist who painted him uh, said he thought he looked like the painter Cezanne. Um, um, so I, uh, yikes, um, that is so funny. Um, well, you can, you can, uh, you can tell Johnny's he, he been actually, promoted. Um, the, um, some of the, we had a big wind, it's, before this snowstorm, we had a windstorm that blew off some, uh, slates from our roof. So I think he was just up in the roof with, with somebody who was coming to look at him. Otherwise I'd ask him to come on the camera Hey, John. <laughs> John, come in. They want uh, show these folks that you are not an reincarnation of Vladimir uh, Lenin. Um, no, no, indeed, and in fact, uh, this uh, portrait that I heard some reference to. There you go. Uh, was not, I, I told you about Cezanne? Yeah, it was right. not it was not done um, uh, at at my request okay. either. It was <laughs> imposed on me. Yes. Okay. Anyhow, but no, I, I hope you agree. He doesn't look like. Um, uh, Vladimir uh, Lenin, although he's responsible uh, for dragging me um, off to the Soviet Union to begin with, because he had studied Russian when he was in the army, and um, uh, I had studied Indonesian. I was all set to go off to East Asia as my first assignment, and uh, instead we got engaged and went off to the Soviet Union together. So I blame that on him. Um, uh, but, um, anyhow, I hope <laughs> that was anyhow. a nice interlude, but so here's a real university question and foreign service question. How should professors like me advise students with an interest in a career with state? Fantastic. Uh, that's, I was realizing I neglected, um, I had some points on that and I, uh, neglected to raise them. Okay. As I said, I'm very concerned that we're taking virtually no one into the State Department. Um, the Foreign Service Officer Corps is about, um, it's, now, it's, it's under 8,000, 7,000 something. Um, and we're taking, you know, the numbers are tiny. At the best of times, they're small. Because I say, that's not a lot of, of uh, diplomats to run 270 diplomatic missions around the world, but we need the best and brightest. So let me mention just a couple things. It's very competitive, but ideally um, these terrible, terrible cuts won't last forever. So I hope you, one, encourage your Congress to um, ask for uh, su uh, sufficient funding. Okay, go to state.gov. 
um, and then just Google careers. Or you can go straight to a website that's called careers.state.gov. It's actually great. It's got so much information about preparing you for the exam, all of the different career tracks you can pursue. Uh, there also is another resource. Um, we have a diplomat in residence who covers Iowa sadly is not located in Iowa, but is located in Illinois instead. Um, she's at the University of Illinois, I think in um, uh, Champaign-Urbana. Um, so uh, what you can do is, is um, ask the university to contact her, see if she can come and give a seminar um, directly um, um, uh, in um, Iowa City. I'm sure she'd be delighted to do it, although she covers a huge area. But there's all sorts of resources online. Um, and aside from, from diplomats, um, uh, in the career track that Janice and I did, we have other specialties involving communications, um, uh, security, and so on. As a matter of fact, given that this is such a dangerous world, a huge percentage of our budget goes not to the traditional diplomatic work of, of um, negotiating trade agreements or consular work or political affairs, but goes to security. Um, so that's another reason why we're so under-resourced, because a huge percentage of our budget goes just to security. But if you know anybody who's interested in security, um, uh, the State Department um, uh, as I say, uh, requires a lot of folks because we're represented all around the world, very dangerous places. I know that's maybe not much of an inducement uh, for a career, um, but if you've got some particularly adventurous folks out there, consider security as well. Um, Laura, we got, we got to wrap it up in just a minute. Okay, so, so as I say, even though we're taking, you know, the freeze is on, uh, we need the best and brightest, so please encourage all your students um, and faculty to look into this as a career. We actually will hire up until the age of 56. Um, and we have also hired a lot of people who joined the State Department as the second career. Um, the typical age of entry for a diplomat ranged around 30. So think of it, think of it as a second career too. So anyhow, state.gov or careers.state.gov, please tell all your friends, your neighbors, your relatives, to consider a career in foreign affairs, but please ask your Congress um, to assure budgets that actually will allow us to hire somebody. So thank you so much um, for allowing me to give you um, my thoughts on um, Thanks, uh, foreign Sue affairs today. Yes, Sue Dulac is gonna close the program for us today. Great. Laura, too, just on my behalf and everybody here, very, very enjoyable, and we do look forward to you coming in, in person. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, and the Stanley UI Foundation support for their generous support, and today's special sponsors, Janice Weiner and Taxus Plus. And I also want to have a particular shout out today for all the tech work, and that was done by J.J. Meyer, an intern. And Ty Coleman and Tony Ugolin uh, from City Channel 4. Thank you, it, it, as well for me. I'm such a tech know-nothing, um, so I really appreciate all that fabulous work. So Laura, when you come here in person, we will give you our highly coveted mug. Oh, all right. <laughs> we owe you a mug. Thank you very much for your all time. Right. All right. Well, thank you guys for, for coming to, to listen. Um, and uh, I really look forward to being able to come in in person. So thank you so much for listening to me.